And this is the Stella Culinary School Podcast, found online at StellaCulinary.com. My name is Jacob Burton. Thank you so much for joining me for once again another live episode of the show. A lot's been going on. You know, I have not had a single day off since we last spoke. Been clocking them good old-fashioned 14-hour days. And that's good. That's a good thing. We had Valentine's Day weekend last week. That doubled up with President's Day weekend. Also, right before the weekend, we had the Nevada governor ease the restrictions uh, for COVID just a little bit. But that really created a, a, a very positive sentiment uh, for diners in general. I saw uh, some local guests that I haven't seen for over a year. A handful of them were coming back in. But, uh, man, were we uh, cranking all weekend long. And the nice thing about our setup uh, is because we take up, you know, our main restaurant, the shore room, takes up about um, half of the first floor of our uh, hotel. So even at 25% capacity, we have a lot of square footage uh, to pe- uh, put people. So uh, we were busy. We did about uh, 17000 in revenue. Uh, just in the one restaurant on Saturday and about uh, 18, 19 um, on Sunday, which was Valentine's Day. And then President's Day, which was Monday uh, after Valentine's, uh, we were still busy. So I've just been getting my ass kicked for the last week straight. But I did not want to skip hopping on with the Stella Corner community. The show must go on for our... A weekly podcast. So I will be monitoring your questions in both the Facebook group and the um, Discord channel. And I do have some notes to talk about today, uh, but I will be kind of going off of your discussion. Last week we tried uh, the YouTube channel live uh, for a little bit, and I still think that's my preferred method. However, we just got to figure out some of the streaming issues. Uh, with that YouTube connection uh, because I had to finish the last half um, on Facebook and I had to edit it together. So that took a a few days. So the podcast was recorded last Friday, uh, but I was late uh, in releasing it. Um, Okay, so those of you who have been following along in the Facebook group and kind of in the uh, podcast universe... We have been talking about the uh, Anova Precision Oven, which I hate that name, to be honest with you. I think it's an awful name. I wish Anova had um, leaned into Combi because Combi, the combination oven, um, it's just a Combi oven is cool, right? If you are in the know in a professional kitchen or just as a cook, right, you know that all the cool kids have the Combi ovens. So I wish they had just called it the Innova Combi and uh, or Innova Combi Oven and uh, have been done with it. But they call it the Innova Precision Oven. But that's neither here nor there. Um, I've been rocking and rolling with it for the last few weeks, uh, basically doing a review of it. Uh, now, to be clear, uh, they did not pay me to do this. They did not send me a free unit. I paid full price. They do not, uh, you know, it's, and at this point, I'm starting to get a little bit butthurt, to be honest with you, uh, because I've been posting some cool content for them on Instagram uh, and tagging their stupid Innova Precision Oven tag and uh, not a single freaking thumbs up or heart or anything, right? So I'm a, I'm a little, little uh, peeved at Innova right now for anno- for just ignoring me. Um, but you know, that's whatever. I'm, I'm kind of sensitive like that. You guys know that doesn't matter though. I like the oven. I like it and I've been playing with it. I want to give you guys an update because I really do think this is going to be a big thing, uh, in your kitchens. And I've been, uh, messing around with, uh, various cooks. I cooked on it a lot on, um, Super Bowl Sunday, which we'll talk about. And I think where people are really kind of missing the boat on this oven is just overall, uh, how it can streamline their execution and make execution easier. And last week, in episode 69 of the podcast, we started the podcast off with a long discussion on prep and execution and firing and, and getting ahead. So 
a, a really common misconception that people have that don't work in professional restaurants is they think for the most part, a lot of the things that are cooked in a kitchen uh, are cooked to order. And if, if that were the, the case, you would be con- constantly just waiting like an hour, hour and a half uh, for your food. So uh, those of you who listen to the podcast, you're under no illusion of that, especially after last week's episode, because we kind of talked about how we uh, prepare and set up our mise en place and how we execute. But being able to prepare anything ahead in a professional environment is really important for streamlining your execution. And normally in in higher end restaurants, right, you're cooking stuff all the minute. So, you know, you're, the 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 steaks and the chicken, the fish, you're pan roasting those to order. Um, but like your risottos, your uh, if, if you're making a risotto, you're gonna par cook it. I kind of explained that in a risotto video. Anything that's taken, you know, 20 minutes plus, you got to figure out a way to par cook it so that way you can finish it on the line um, and and do your final seasoning and final execution for it. So what uh, the issue with uh, anytime you're cooking something ahead is quality loss. So ideally, if you're uh, cooking something ahead of time uh, or even firing extra orders, which we call sandbagging. So an example is if if I'm working a saute station, I'm, I'm just getting completely crushed and I have you know four steaks come in. So say it's like four flat iron steaks. I'm going to drop two large pans and I'm going to cook eight. Right, we're in the middle of our of our dinner rush. I'm going to lay down eight steaks in those uh, hot saute pans because chances are, by the time those hit my oven and and even uh, at the, come anywhere close to mid rare, I'm going to have four more steaks coming behind. So that's something that we call sandbagging. So you kind of you you're getting ahead uh, on it and you're and you're keeping your your head above water. Now the whole trick with cooking anything ahead or sandbagging is the guest can't know. Right, the guest. I mean, as far as taste and quality. Uh, you don't want any loss in taste and quality. So the biggest issue comes then with uh, holding your your uh, your product in a quality fashion, right? So that way you don't lose um, any of what makes it good in the first place. Now this is hard to do for an extended period of time because you have different areas in your kitchen that you can hold stuff hot. I mean, you can have a, an oven at a low temperature, but that's not really realistic. Um, oven space is limited in a professional kitchen. Um, and in a home, you normally only have one oven, right? So if you're using your oven just for holding stuff, now your oven is, is locked up at a low temperature. The other problem with an oven, as we know, is what? Well, yeah, the heat transfer, right? So we know that hot air is bad at transferring heat uh, to any given item. That's why you can stick your hand in a you know, pot of boiling water at 212 degrees Fahrenheit at sea level, and it'll burn you instantly, but you stick your hand into a 500-degree oven uh, to pull out you know, whatever it is that you're roasting, and your hand can be in there for a few seconds without even really um, affecting you, right? You're not going to feel that instant heat. So because of that, ovens and dry air in general are really bad at transferring a consistent temperature. Not to mention the way the ovens are designed, they have anywhere from, you know, I mean, they could have as much as a 30 degree temp swing plus or minus. So if you set your oven for, say, 350 degrees Fahrenheit, a lot of the times the way that your oven will operate is it will uh, heat itself up to, say, uh, 375 and then turn itself off and drop down to 325 or 330 or whatever and it'll kind of hit that that heating wave and oscillate back and forth and then the mean temperature is somewhere around where you set it which is you know 350 degrees which is okay for most applications when you're baking or you're roasting because you don't need to have that thin of a um uh you don't need to have that much precision uh, of, of temperature. Now, when you're trying to hold something, that can run into an issue. You know, a, a, a 10 degree uh, swing up is going gonna, is gonna to over temp your steak by a temp or a temp and a half. So you're taking your mid rare steak that you're trying to hold and now it's medium or mid well. Your, your medium steak is now well done, right? Those are, that's going to cause you big issues. Number one, if you're in your home, right, you just wasted your money on, on a steak. Um, in a restaurant kitchen, it's going to, uh, people are going to send their food back. You're going to have to refire it. And that's a whole thing, right? So 
where the uh, ANOVA, well, and that's, back up for a second, before we even get to that, that's why people really love sous vide, right? Because, again, you have the precision temperature control. Now, way back in 2012, when I was developing uh, my uh, S-STEP curriculum for my culinary boot camp, so for those of you who don't know, back in the day, uh, I started the free culinary school podcast, right? That transition into Stella Culinary, uh, and then the restaurant that I was at at the time called Stella Restaurant, uh, we would shut down uh, twice a year and we would do a culinary boot camp. Well, when I first developed that, it was for basically the free culinary school super fans, right, that have gone through a lot of the content and want to do an in-person cooking course with me for a week. And one of the things that was kind of controversial when I was developing uh, the curriculum was my large section on sous vide. And the people that I worked with and, you know, a couple of people were like, look, at Jacob, no one's going to show up to your boot camp and want to learn about sous vide because no one's even going to have an immersion circulator. And at this time, the, immer- the only immersion circulator available to you um, was a poly science and the poly science. I think they, by the time that I actually did the boot camp, the uh, poly science came out with their professional line, which was like $800 at the time. But before that, your only other option was their $1,200, like big, uh, steel cage circulator, which is the one that I had. And my argument was, look, if, if these people are going to spend $2,000, and a week of their time to do a hands-on cooking class with me, uh, chances are they have pretty well-equipped kitchens. And when they learn about the precision control of an immersion circulator, uh, they're all going to want to buy one, right? I mean, they have you know $10,000 ranges in their homes. Why wouldn't they want a device that can guarantee them a dead-on mid-rare every single time? And sure enough, when these students would come to the boot camp, they would be on Amazon during my my sous vide lecture, and they'd all be ordering their immersion circulators. So the reason why people love their immersion circulators is for the first time, it gives them the ability to hit a very, very precise temperature. Where a lot of people run into issues with their immersion circulators is, again, the execution phase, right? So remember, in the S-Dub curriculum, we have basically three main components, which is flavor structure plus technique, in parentheses, times execution. And that's to make people realize that it doesn't matter how great your flavors are, doesn't matter how great your technique is, uh, if you can't execute, then your flavor structure and your technique doesn't matter. A really good example of this is let's say you go out and you buy a beautifully marbled uh, Wagyu ribeye. You spent a lot of money on this sucker, right? And uh, as we all know, the whole reason why, say, a, a prime grade ribeye is a prime grade, is the intramuscular marbling, okay? It's the fat content. So the more fat, the more flavor, the more juiciness, the more the more tenderness uh, this steak will have, and people pay a premium for that, right? So that's why you have your prime grade and then your choice grade but uh, right below that, and then your select, which isn't, uh, you know, very, very uh, minimal fat and, and marbling. So you go out, you buy this steak, you spend a lot of money on it, get a nice thick, like, two-inch cut, and you cook it sous vide, you cook it right at a mid-rare temperature, and let's say you you know let's uh, you like it at 130, 132 um, internal, and you let it sit there for four hours. It's the perfect core temperature, and then during the execution stage, you pull it out, you give it a sear, and you and it, and and because it's all wet and because it's the exterior surface isn't really uh, you know uh, dry enough to to conduct energy that well. Um, it takes a long time to sear and you forgot to rest in between, uh, or maybe you were in a bit of a hurry. And now that really nice thick cut steak is at a mid well, right? Because you start at a mid rare temperature from a dead stop. You add more heat to the surface, the heat transferred inward instantly, uh, because there is no heat up process on the surface. And now you're looking at a hundred dollar mid well steak and you're kind of bummed out, right? So what happened? Well, you, you screwed the pooch on the execution. Okay, uh, and that's where a lot of a lot of chefs and a lot of cooks mess up is the execution side. 
So there's a whole series that we go through in our sous vide podcast that really focuses on the execution side of sous vide. Now, here's the thing with sous vide, though. You know what I use sous vide for all the time at home? In fact, the number one thing that makes me actually reach for my immersion circulator uh, is when I forget to defrost something. Because I, I, I hate the defrost mode in microwaves. Uh, they always coagulate some proteins really weird. So my favorite thing to do is I grab my immersion circulator. If I'm in a rush, I set up a little tank of water. Uh, I set the circulator to 70 degrees uh, Fahrenheit, and I drop in whatever I, I have to defrost, and it's usually done in 15 minutes, right? It's great for that. Outside of that, the whole sous vide thing in a home kitchen, unless I'm trying to really do something to impress company, um, is a total hassle. I got to grab a pot. I got to fill it with water. I got to set up the circulator. I got to let it come out to temp. And then God forbid I have like a bag break in the, uh, in the water pot itself. Uh, and then also too, you have a whole issue with when you're doing like longer cooks, uh, you maybe have like, I mean, anyone who's braised short ribs for 24, 48 hours, uh, you may have had this issue where you don't sear it well enough. So because of that, when you stick the short ribs uh, or any meat, pork shoulder, whatever, um, in a bag, it blows off gas. And so now your bags puff and sometimes it'll, that puffiness will break your bag. Uh, and also, too, because those gases are, are in the bag kind of puffed up. Um, it gets a weird sort of funky flavor. Now that weird funky flavor can sometimes be hidden by the fact that you resear the meat and then you reduce the sauce and you have a nice glaze on it. Um, but then you, I mean, when it comes to actually executing it, you're pulling it out, you're resting it. I mean, it, it's a whole thing. Now I am a big proponent of sous vide. I have talked about sous vide for a long time, but this is why I like the Innova uh, combi oven, right? Which is what I'm naming it. I, I refuse to call it the Nova, uh, Nova precision oven. Because what everyone misses is it's not just a steam injection oven. It is a steam controlled oven. That's what combis do is they actually give you a precise temperature uh, by using steam because steam is much more efficient and effective at transferring heat than just the, the, uh, the dry air. So what I did the other day is uh you know so as i'm uh on sunday as i'm getting absolutely you know you go from saturday night right the night before valentine's day um all day we we're busy you know from from morning to night because you know we open up for breakfast we do a whole brunch thing right once we open up the doors at uh, at 8 a.m uh, there's no close until 9 p.m that night right so you know we go through all three services Saturday was super busy, a great, great dinner service uh, Saturday night. Then Sunday back at it, early morning for brunch. We're getting absolutely crushed. Anyone who's ever worked a busy brunch service uh, knows that the most important guy on the line, who is your most important guy on the line during a busy brunch service? Not me. I'm usually up there conducting traffic, right? Uh, which that's the the expediting position uh, in the kitchen is, is the guy who's finishing the plates and then giving it to the front of the house expediter. That's usually what the chef does and also kind of bails people out uh, when they're in the weeds, right? The most important guy on your line is your egg cook during brunch, okay? Nothing will crumble a breakfast line faster than an egg cook having an egg meltdown. And the the the, the quickest way... Right, the number one way that you see uh, somebody's soul just get crushed uh, on the egg station during a busy brunch is poached eggs, and you sell a lot of poached eggs. And it's funny when you watch like the poached eggs demonstrations on, uh, you know, like you like a YouTube channel or even in the um, what is it? The modernist cuisine book, right? They 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 have their, their little section on poached eggs, and they're like, "Well, you get your little pot here, and then here's the secret. Here's the real secret that all the pros use: is they take a whisk and they swirl the water really fast, and then when you drop in your eggs, you have that centripetal force hold the white together, and then you get a nice, you know, looking egg, and." You know, I'm looking at that. I'm like, bullshit. Like, that's that's cool if you're some lonely billionaire in Seattle that's cooking eggs Benedict for one, 
All right, because the moment you try and swirl that water again to drop in another two eggs or another 10 eggs or another 20 eggs, you're in fucksville. Okay, so you're constantly doing this rotation of poaching, 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 pulling, dabbing on the Benedict, on the side plate, whatever it is. And I'm watching this whole process go down and I'm thinking to myself, damn, it sure would be nice to have my Anova precision oven here um, on a steam setting. And just all my eggs held, held hot. Now, again, going, circling back to the pre-cooking stage, right? In a lot of really busy brunch restaurants, they will poach all of their eggs either the morning of or the day before. Now, we don't do that because it's really hard to bring those eggs back without quality loss, right? Because it's already at a perfect temperature um, and you, then you, you chill it down. So there's the whole icing process and you're going to take those eggs and basically pop them back in to simmering water on what we call the pickup. And those eggs are going to supposedly go out hot with a nice creamy yolk, uh, you know, runny center. Um, and, you know, but uh, a lot of the times that's why you have shitty poached eggs and in busy breakfast places. Now, Anyone who's ever done sous vide eggs, you understand that you can very much control the temperature of uh, of how the egg cooks and how it coagulates. You know, everyone talks about the 63 degree egg or the 63.5 degree egg, right? And I agree, the yolk is a nice texture. The white, not so much. Okay, but the white is bearable. Um, but it's but that whole technique and temperature is really about. Um, about the yolk, right? But shelling those eggs is a nightmare, an absolute nightmare. You always have whites that stick to it, and then you're trying to re-therm it, and it always sounds like a good idea until you do it, right? Because you also, too, you have the circulator, you know, bumping the eggs around and shit, right? So, I mean, so we used to actually take, when I first <laughs> attempted to do this, you would take the eggs, you would cook them sous vide, 63 degrees Celsius, um, and then you would, you know, chill them. Next day, you re-therm them again in, this, in the same uh, temperature water uh, and hold them. Or you could go like a couple degrees below, so you hold your water like at, say, 60. And we would use the um, the wire whisks um, that attach to your KitchenAid. And you put the eggs inside that wire whisk to keep them from banging around um, in the circulator because you have that, that current going. Uh, but inevitably, it just it turns into a whole thing, trying to crack those things into a bowl. The whites are sticking. The egg looks all kind of funky and really weird, you know, and uh, off to the side. And you got uh, it's, it's, it's just a whole thing. And sometimes it's too wet. And you're talking about trying. I mean, it's cool when you got a couple of friends over uh, and you're trying to do a fun little eggs Benedict dish for them. Um, but try doing that like a hundred times while you're doing omelets, right? While you're doing, you know, uh, sautés for, you know, sauté sets, you know, while you're actually trying to cook a full breakfast while it's, uh, oh, can I get, uh, no ham, but, uh, you know, a little bit of, uh, extra butter, but hold the toast and blah, blah, blah. Like it's, it's a whole thing. I mean, modifiers just totally crush kitchens and no one likes to modify more than the brunch crowd. It's just the, you know, the nature of, of the beast. So it's all about streamlining execution so i'm sitting there we're getting crushed and i'm thinking to myself damn it sure would be nice to have perfectly poached eggs uh sitting in my combi oven just kind of ready to go and here's the thing is combi ovens do exist in professional kitchens but they're big and they're bulky even the smallest ones are the size of a large convection oven for the most part so it's not it's not convenient to have those those large combi ovens um anywhere close to where you're plating food right at least like on in a hotline setting hotlines are all, always really really cramped for space your uh, surface area is always at a premium in fact little pro tip for anybody who's designing a professional kitchen is surface area that's that's the one thing that everyone misses is surface area they have their stoves they have their lights they have all these other things right um, even in a home kitchen, service area, counter space, because when it comes time to uh, to actually rock and roll, where are you going to put all those fucking plates? I don't know. I literally, I, I worked in a, a a little side note. I worked in a restaurant called the Big Water Grill uh, in Incline Village. It's part of the the Hyatt, and a beautiful restaurant right on Lake Tahoe. 
And uh, summertime, it is super busy. I mean, you could do 400, 500, sometimes 600 covers in a night. And you have like a five or six person hotline. Every single station on that hotline. So it, it was literally, you had, let's see, you had your, your, your Garmo slash dessert station. That was one station. Your saute station, your grill station, and then a salad station right next to it. So you basically had four stations. Each station could play or could had the, the counter space to lay down three plates at a time. So three times four, for all my math was out there is 12. Can you imagine the backlog of trying to put out 600 dinners between 5.30 and 8 p.m. every single night, only being able to plate as a team at your, mo at your max efficiency, 12 plates at a time? Do you think we ever got out of the weeds there? No, <laughs> never. The only thing that got us out of the weeds was a snowstorm in November. And that, and that was it. Outside of that, in the weeds constantly. So counter space is at a premium in professional kitchens. What the 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 market that Anova has completely missed that they haven't even gone after is guys like me who are like, shit, I'll buy two of these things and stick them on my hotline and, and use it just for holding stuff. I don't need to roast things in there. I don't need to sear things in there. I just need a small holding oven, right? And for that, they are beautiful. So I, I ordered two more. I ordered two more ovens from Anova, and then I, I grabbed my my Anova from home because I couldn't really wait to uh, test this thesis, and I brought it into the professional kitchen. We've been playing with it for the last few days, and my cooks are super excited. It is a, a lifesaver. We can... Poach eggs, the traditional method, because I prefer that texture, right? I want that nice, solid white on the outside. I also kind of like the organic look of it. I don't really want to like, poach them in dishes, although you could, right? Um, and then the setup that we have going now is we're able to put a what we call a two-inch a half hotel. So we use, a, we're talking like nine pans, six pans, that sort of stuff. Uh, we have hotel pans, right? Uh, that's what we, that's kind of a, a storage pan that you use. So a full hotel pan is a rectangular pan that's uh, usually you know, two, four, six inches deep. And you'll see chefs putting different, you know, things in there. Um, so your, uh, <clears throat> your Anova can fit a half hotel. I believe it can also fit a two thirds hotel, which is a really rare size. You almost, you know, you almost never see that. And, and when I do my full complete breakdown of this and like, a you know, review later on down the line where I take all this information that we're talking about and consolidate it into one, one of the things that I will be talking about is the different sizes and shapes of pans to maximize your cooking space. But our, our current egg setup in the morning right now is you have uh, two half hotels, uh, one on the top rack, one on the very bottom. So it's not even a, a rack, it's just sitting on the bottom of the oven. And then you're, that gives you space to have a small section in the middle of maybe two inches, right? Which is perfect for a, a bread and butter plate, right? Which can hold eggs. So you start your day, your, your busy brunch. Well, let's just, let's just say you're not busy, okay? For sand, so now you have the ability to sandbag your eggs with lossless quality. All right, um, if a if your if your your dining room just got sat, we'll say twenty people, you know, spread out across a few tables. When that first order of uh, poached eggs or eggs Benedict comes in, the first two orders, right, um, on that first table, you know that you're going to sell another five orders, right? However. Traditionally, if you fired all five orders uh, at that time, now you have issues with holding the eggs warm or maybe them cooling and then having to repoach, and then you're going to over temp them, right? Now, the thing with, with being in a, in a busy restaurant environment is if, you know, if, if you're, say, a busy brunch service, like for us, like a really busy brunch service is uh, 300 people, okay, uh, throughout the, the entire service. But it's not; it's never evenly spaced, right? You have that crunch time uh, between like 10 a.m. and 1 p.m. where you are just getting hammered. And what are you going to do? If you have space to seat people, of course you're going to seat them, right? And, and you're going to uh, train your hosts to, to seat them properly so that way you have a good flow and, and, and the tables that are being sat 
aren't actually suffering, but you're always going to have that bottleneck point. The point being that if I was able to basically take that those 300 covers and divide them across 15 minute increments throughout my entire brunch service or dinner service, those 300 covers would be much more easy to execute, right? And that's what an oven that allows you to hold something precisely does for you. So now on an average day, you get a couple orders of poached eggs. You drop them, you drop four or five, you poach them. Uh, you serve the two that are on order and then you put hold the other two in the combi oven. All right. On a really busy day, you can pre-poach to the perfect temperature and you can have your prep cook in the back, right? It's not that hard to poach eggs, right? What's, <laughs> what's hard about poaching eggs is poaching eggs like a hundred times perfectly while doing omelets, while doing scrambles, while doing sautés, and the tick is getting absolutely crushed and trying to hold all those modifiers in your heads, right? So the act of just focusing on poaching eggs isn't really that hard. It's doing it within the environment or within the context of executing in a professional kitchen. So now you can have your prep cook chilling in the back, listen to death metal or whatever the, you know he or she likes to listen to uh, on an induction burner, just poaching eggs all day long. Boom, 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 poaching eggs. And also, it's a good low-stress training environment for that prep cook to learn how to perfectly poach eggs and to get that muscle memory and that sort of sense and intuition. And then that way, if you ever move them up to the egg station, they already have that muscle memory and that intuitive feel for poaching eggs, which is going to be great. Right. So then you have those sitting already preloaded, single layer, a little bit of water just for a little bit of a, of a barrier in your half hotels, ready to rock and roll. And then your setup is this. Start the day or start your rush with your half hotel on the top with your poached eggs, half hotel on the bottom with your poached eggs. That middle section is then for your over easies and your scrambles and things like this, because a lot of times in a kitchen, uh, a busy brunch kitchen, the guy who's making your omelet or doing your over easy eggs, he's focusing just on on that, right? And then you have another section of the kitchen, either across from him or next from that is building the set, right? They're the ones that are firing the potatoes uh, or the hash browns. They're the ones that are uh, doing the pancakes and the French toast. Usually, too, they're cooking like the bacon and the sausage, which is already par-cooked. They're just finishing it, crisping it up, and they're building those plates. And maybe the flat top person across from your A guy is getting absolutely crushed on French toast. And you need a French toast to sell your two over easies and your uh, over medium plus your, your your three classic Benedicts, right? You guys remember all that? You should. So what do you do? Well, do you just sit there and you got to wait till like all your sets are ready while your other tickets are piling up and juggle and say, okay, well, now I'm going to, uh, I'm going to fire table 42 with the two over easy, blah, 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 blah. No. So this way, right. As the eggs come in, you start firing them. I got my over easies. I got my scrambles, blah, 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 blah. You put them on little B and B plates and you're sticking them in that middle section uh, in the combi oven, uh, which is holding the eggs at a perfect temperature without drying out because you also have a little bit of steam injection going on, right? So this way, when the sets are ready, the the chef who is usually conducting everything can then just open up that oven, take out the eggs, slide them onto the plate. Same thing when, you, the, when your person is building your Benedict plate, right? The Benedict plate gets built. You got your uh, toasted English muffin. You got your protein, uh, you know, classically your uh, uh, Canadian bacon. But we also do like a smoked salmon Benedict. A lot of restaurants will do like a veggie Benedict, right? You'll have like a, a couple different Benedicts on the menu. So you build these plates, kind of set them off to the side. You can have your potatoes done, kind of sitting in a warm spot on your kitchen and your shelf, right? And then when you're ready to sell... You pull the, the poached eggs, you, you drop them onto your Benny, you sauce them with your hollandaise and send. And that's what, one of the things that we actually use our immersion circulator for uh, in the professional kitchen on the hotline is we will uh, weigh all the ingredients for our hollandaise, bag them in bags, cook them sous vide so that way the eggs are at the perfect temperature, not over overcoagulated, not undercoagulated, because it's the co coagulation of the egg yolk, which is what thickens your... Um, sauce plus the emulsification of the clarified butter and then we'll take these warm cooked bags pop them in our Vitamix blender bzz, blend them up in like 30 seconds pour them into an ISI whipper so your, your whipped cream canister right charge them up shake them up and we hold those warm at 60 degrees celsius 140 uh, fahrenheit 
um, in our immersion circulator bath. So that way we have hot hollandaise on demand in an enclosed environment so it's not uh, covering or it's not uh, forming a skin, right? And we you, you have the extra benefit of that little bit of aeration uh, lightens up that hollandaise sauce. So it's a really nice end product. So as you can see, the whole setup streamlines your workflow. Now when you're, and then you're always pulling from the top for your poach, right? So that top half hotel pan in your combi oven, you're pulling that uh, for your poach. When that's empty, right? Your bottom pan now becomes your top pan, your working pan. And now you're reaching down uh, into your refrigerated drawers beneath you. You're pulling out another preloaded half hotel that now goes into the bottom position. And by the time you sell the eggs in that top half hotel pan, the bottom, the eggs in your bottom hotel pan have now gently come up to temperature uh, using sous vide, and then you continue that rotation. And so it's really all about streamlining that efficiency, streamlining that execution, and that's what the Anova uh, Combi oven allows you to do. And in a home kitchen, it's no different. And, and, and this is going to be your secret weapon for executing when you want to throw those dinner parties because it's going to allow you to hold stuff. It's going to buy you time uh, for, for, you know, you're not constantly just juggling shit around, right? And the, and I, look, at I, I have some issues, uh, you know, with the Innova. But it's 600 bucks. It's 600 bucks. If all this thing did was hold my poached eggs perfectly, it's well worth the investment price. The way I look at it, I buy two of these things, uh, $1,300 with shipping all in, okay? Uh, they send them to my restaurant. I got one on each side of the hotline, all right? If I have to buy two more in a year because my cooks break them, whatever. That's like 108 bucks a month, okay? $108 a month is what I pay to lease one of my five different uh, glassware washing uh, machines, right? Uh, dishwashers throughout my property, okay? So when you look at it in a professional kitchen from an equipment lease standpoint, um, it's a great investment. It's a, it's a no-brainer. I'm going to streamline my services. Uh, being able to have a, a, a temperature-controlled combi oven on the line, and they're so small, you can stick them anywhere. And this is also too, excuse me, this is also too why the uh, Anova really needs to look at widening the inside of their ovens just by like an inch and a half so you can get the full sheet pan in there, right? Because that's going to really drop that barrier to entry. And as long as they can do that and still keep these ovens under $1,000, right? So what they would want to do to really hit that, that professional market is widen it so it can fit a half sheet pan and then they have to make their water reservoir, right? They have to make that a little bit more sturdy. It's a little bit flimsy for the home kitchen. You're not going to be moving it or banging it too much. It'll be fine. But I guarantee you probably within a couple of months, I'm going to break that thing and need a replacement. And right now on Anova or uh, on the Anova website, all I can do is go and buy the oven or their circulators. I can't buy any of the other component parts, right? I need more racks. I need backup tanks. Uh, so if it breaks on me, I can replace it. Um, and they don't have any of those options. So that's what they need to do. Now, how this translates into the home kitchen, let me kind of uh, give you an idea. So first of all, I don't think we ever talked about the, um, the tri-tip that I did, which was a bit of a failure, but only because we were paving new ground, right? We were, um, you know, I was trying something new. And, and that's the price that you pay, right, for trying to actually create something newer and better and thinking outside of the box is um, you're going to fuck shit up sometimes, right? You're, you're testing. You're testing. That's what happens, right? You're just going you're to you're, you're lose some product. And the tri-tip was still edible, um, but it wasn't amazing because I overcooked it. You go over, yeah, I overcooked it, right? It happens because here, here's the process. Here's what I want to do. First of all, you know, everyone's obsessed with, with reverse sear. And reverse sear is fine. It's a it's a fine technique. It works great. And your your Anova combi oven 
um, will excel at reverse sear. Uh, those of you who have watched my um, my hamburger video, where I take those big, thick, like uh, eight inch or uh, eight ounce uh, patties that I grind in house, and I put them in a low oven. I put I, I believe I set the oven like at 200, 225 with an internal probe thermometer. Right, and then when they hit a mid-rear temperature, I pull them out, let them rest a second, and then sear them. And it's a great way to do big, thick, juicy burgers because that low, slow heat start um, allows the proteins to coagulate without a whole lot of juice loss, and it helps to hold the burger shape. Now, people do this with ribeye steaks. It's a great technique. You can do it with any number of, of proteins that you're trying to cook, mid-rear or medium. Uh, but but people, you know. They find a technique that allows them to cook a solid steak for the first time in their life, and and now they're like evangelists for it. But what you guys need to understand is reverse sear is, is just a technique like anything else. And what a lot of people are missing the boat on with the ANOVA, or in general, what people have gotten away from, is just the traditional roast. And the traditional roast is you start with high heat, you know, blast the exterior of your meat. And then drop the temperature of your oven, and uh, and cook to your finished temperature and pull. And in a traditional oven, you're you're pulling at a you know 10, 15 degrees lower, uh, because you're going to have that carryover cooking. Okay, a good example of this is how a lot of people traditionally do uh, prime rib roasts. Right, normally you'll uh, you'll season your rib roast. You pop it in your oven first 15 to 20 minutes. You're blasting at like full speed. Right, 550, 500, however hot your oven can go, and you're really crisping that sucker up. And then uh, after that first 15 to 20 minutes. You're dropping the temp down to say 300, 250, depending on how much time you have, and letting it slowly come up to that mid rare medium temperature, whatever you, you want your finished temperature to be. Now, the great thing about the the Innova Combi oven is I can stick a probe thermometer in a piece of meat, and then on my iPhone app, I can go and say, hey, uh, I want you to start with a, a, a roasting cycle that lasts either 20 minutes or until you hit X temperature internally, right? Because it, you can control it by the internal probe thermometer. So I want this to last, uh, you know, 15 minutes. Um, and I know after 15 minutes at 375, my oven's going to, uh, or my, my piece of meat is going to be nice and roasted. Then I want you to drop to a slow roast. But instead of a slow roast, we're going to actually bring in some more precision control, right? And instead of a slow roast, I want you to sous vide. And I want you to sous vide up to whatever my, my desired temperature is. Let's call it 135. So then your next step is I want you to sous vide at 135 for four hours. Then after that, because I listen to Chef Jacob, and Chef Jacob's kind of a smart guy, I know that the reason why if I slice my meat uh, and I get those juices that pool all over my cutting board, it's because the protein filaments in that meat can't really absorb uh, much moisture or hold on to their moisture at temperatures above 125 degrees Fahrenheit. So oven, after you sous vide my meat for at 135, because I like it right like a notch below, a notch below medium, right? And you always have those people like, I like my steak like mid-rare plus. And it's like, bro, I'm cooking like fucking 50 of these things. You want mid-rare plus? Like pick a temperature. It's mid-rare or medium, right? Cool. I'll, I'll hit that hair degree in between. Mid-rare is 130, right? Or 132, depending on who you ask. Uh, and, and medium is 140. I'm kind of picky. I like it mid-rare plus. I say, hey, oven, I want you to bring this to 135. And I want you to hold it there for four hours so it's nice and tender. And then, oven, I want you to, after that four-hour cycle... Uh, I want you to drop down to 125. So uh, when the mood strikes me to eat, I can then slice you without losing any juices because you're perfectly rested. Uh, cool. So you're good to go. I'm going to press play, and then I'm going to go and do shit for like six to eight hours and come back to a perfectly roasted piece of meat. Your oven can do that for you out of the box. Pretty cool, right? Now, what I try to do with my tri-tip is I did my teriyaki marinade. I did that for a couple of days. And then it's actually more like a week. And the reason why it's more like a week is because I forgot about it. So I throw it in my teriyaki marinade. It's about six days later. I'm getting ready to go to work in the morning. And I'm like, oh, shit, I got to cook this tri-tip. <laughs> it's been in here for a while, right? So what I do... As I say, I'm not really sure how I'm going to do this thing yet, but uh, I'm just going to 
uh, stick the probe thermometer in, uh, put it in the cold combi oven, and then I'm going to go to work. And then at work, I, I pulled up my, my iPhone, you know, that's connected to the internet, and my oven's connected to the internet, and I programmed the oven from start to finish at work. And the stages were this, and I'll kind of walk you through my, my thought process behind it. Because again, I think it'll kind of show you some of the cool novel things that you can do uh, with your combi oven. So first, I said, hey, what I'd like for you to do, oven, is I would like for you to uh, heat, uh, turn yourself on to 106 degrees Fahrenheit, sous vide mode, okay? Until the 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 tri-tip hits an, an internal temperature of 103 then in stage two i'd like you to drop down to 103 sous vide mode the reason why is because you don't have as the the efficiency of heat transfer is just barely a little bit less um than a, a full-on water bath so while you can bring uh a the the internal temperature of your meat up to an equilibrium um, over a long period of time within your oven, it, it takes a while, right? It'll be like, so if I want it to be 103 and I set my oven at 103, the meat's going to heat up at a pretty um, uh, consistent pace, like 100. And that last three degrees uh, is going to take a really long time to get to. So w with that in mind, I'm like, hey, hit, uh, heat to 106, right? When the probe thermometer inside the uh, uh, tri-tip says that you're 103, I want you to drop to 103, and I want you to hold it there for one hour, right? Because what that does is there's a certain set of enzymes that hyperactivate at, at that 103 temperature, that make your meat tender and juicy, same th and flavorful. It's the same thing that hyperactivates um, in uh, a dry aging. Now, there's a second set of enzymes that hyperactivates at 120. So then I say, after that hour on stage three, I want you to now set your uh, temperature to 125 sous vide mode. And when the internal probe thermometer uh, hits 120, I want you to kick down in stage four to 120 sous vide mode and hold the meat at 120 for another hour, right? So now you have that heat up phase, you have your two holding phases to make the meat extremely tender. Now I wanna take it to my, my final core temperature. At the final core temperature, I want you to heat the, the tri-tip up to 138. So I'm gonna set you at 140, right? I want you to let it come up to 140. At 140, I want you to kick down to 138 and I want you to hold it at 138 for four hours. And I'm gonna have a super tender tri-tip. Now, for those of you kind of playing along at home, you realize that I haven't seared this thing yet. Well, at one f at at four hours at one thirty eight, I now want you to turn yourself off, and you can't actually tell it to turn itself off. So what I did is I programmed it to uh, turn its temperature down to one seventy. Now, here's the first sort of hiccup that I ran into, which I think they can do with a, a firmware update, is you can trigger stages of cooks on the way up right with your internal probe thermometer but you can't reverse trigger them on the way down and where this comes in handy is if you're resting a piece of meat and then want to up temp it again for a sear so again we're basically doing a reverse sear uh, on this tri-tip now the whole point behind this process is can i do an amazingly perfectly cooked reverse seared tri-tip that's cooked sous vide without touching it without opening the oven once. That was the challenge, right? If I get to open the oven and let things kind of cool off and I'm sitting there kind of babysitting it on my day off, right? Way easy, way easy, right? So the challenge was, can I do this from start to finish without opening that oven door once? So to make that happen, after that sous vide cook, I want the tri-tip to drop down to 140, or excuse me, to drop, to drop down to 100 degrees Fahrenheit internal, okay? So... I set the oven uh, to to turn itself to to 70 degrees Fahrenheit uh, and allow the tri-tip to cool off. Now, if I opened up the door, it would cool off faster. But remember, I'm at work, right? And at this point, it's probably about 5.30 uh, in the evening. We're uh, getting ready for dinner service. And I'm kind of checking my phone. Cool thing is you can actually see what the, the live internal temp read is. So what I realized, so I, I basically took a guess and said, hey, I'm going to let you rest in the oven for an hour but that wasn't long enough. So as I get to like the 45 minute mark, I reset that time. I say, okay, well, I want you to keep the 70 degree oven stage for another hour. And so at about another hour, 
it had dropped uh, to so about two hours total. It dropped from a 138 internal down to a 100 degree internal. So then the final stage was to roast. And what I want to do is kick on the roasting <clears throat> and have it roast at uh, 375 degrees Fahrenheit to get that exterior color. And I was also kind of in my mental calculations uh, taking into uh, account the fact that I had a sugary marinade, right? The teriyaki has sugar in it. Uh, so it's going to burn easier. So I had to kind of adjust my time temp. If it was just salt and pepper, I might have gone like 425 Fahrenheit for 15 to 20 minutes. Uh, but this, I, I believe I did like 375 at 15. And I, I, I had the pull the plug setting, right? I basically said, and when my my uh, flat, or excuse me, when my tri tip uh, hits 130 degrees internal, I want you to turn yourself to sous vide mode at 125 Fahrenheit, which is our perfect resting temperature, right? And that's where things kind of went sideways a little bit. Now, as I was driving home, I got home right in time to watch the. Uh, the 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 roasting phase kick on, and at this point everything looked good, right? It was roasting, roasting, roasting. Now because the combi oven doesn't have a vent fan to help to cool it off fast, right? When it hit that that one thirty internal, the uh, the carryover cooking started to run away from me, right? So I got so even though the oven turned itself back down to a lower temperature. It just kept on climbing, 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 climbing. Uh, it hit 140. Uh, then it got as high as 150, and then it started to drop down. At this point, uh, the the tri tip had been cooking for um, about 10 hours from start to finish, right up, uh, down, and back. Um, and my wife and daughter were were kind of uh, ready to eat, so I was like, "Ah, screw it, let's let's cool, pull it and, and slice it." Now. Because of the marinade and because of that slow and long uh, heat up and drop, right, the um, the protein, so when you do a slow heat up, the, uh, the myoglobin, which is what makes uh, the juices or the blood and the meat uh, red, which when you actually have a cut of meat, it's actually juices in it and it's not blood, right? It's not blood in the meat, in the muscle. Um, but it's the way the myoglobin sets within that meat uh, it keeps it red, right? So it kind of holds that that look, even if you overshoot a little bit. And this is kind of what freaks people out about sous vide uh, chicken, right? Especially if you're doing it on the bone. Um, that that area around the bone, no matter how safe that chicken is to eat, when you do that slow heat up, it remains pink, right? So it kind of freaks people out. So when I sliced into the to the tri tip, it was a nice even like it looked medium, right? Even though I knew it wasn't. It was a nice, even, medium-looking piece of meat all the way through from edge to edge, like you would expect from a normal sous vide, right? Um, and then when I tasted it, it tasted pretty damn good for a couple of reasons. Number one, I didn't blast it all the way past 155, 160. And at 155, that's where your muscle fibers really fully con constrict and push out a lot of their moisture. It's kind of the point of no return. At 160, you're, you're in uh, total, complete, well-done territory. And it's going to dry out. There's no saving it. The obvious um, exceptions to this is like really uh, tough cuts of meat that have the collagen that you need to break down. But the moisture from from like your briskets and your short ribs and that sort of stuff come from number one, your sauce, but number two, all the extra fat and collagen that's, that's breaking down intramuscularly, right, is, is helping to give you that moist sort of tender shredded flavor. However, if you blast that forever, it's, it's going to dry out as well. Anyways, I digress. So I sliced into it. The flavor was good. Good, you know, teriyaki flavor, good char. Um, everything about it was good, except I just overshot my time. But that was the first time I had done it, right? Again, the challenge was this. Can I put a tri-tip or a prime rib or something of that nature in my oven, press the play button, walk away, and have it perfectly, perfectly reversed seared, and resting from start to finish without any other interaction from me? And the answer to that question is yes. Have I done it yet? No. Will I? <laughs> you fucking better believe it, right? Uh, and then on uh, for Super Bowl Sunday, right, I did some wings in there. It was great. I'm not going to get too far into the process. It's pretty straightforward. Uh, but what I really liked about it as well is so I baked some bread in there, right? Um, the steam setting is great for your bread crust. 
Um, as you know, I mean, in other bread videos, you see me using like Dutch ovens and hotel pans with uh, foil over the top for the baguettes. This, I can just put a baking stone in there, um, you know, steam for the first five, 10 minutes of the bake. Beautiful oven spring, beautiful crust. So it's really great for bread bakers. So I, I baked some, uh, some buns and I made pulled pork. Now, again, the pulled pork was really nice because traditionally, if you're, if you're going to do pulled pork sous vide, you have to worry about searing it evenly and then bagging it and then you're, you're putting it in your water bath. And now you have your circulator on your counter for 18 to 24 hours. Um, and then you, I mean, and, and again, those long sous vide meats, they have a propensity to build up a little bit of a, of a funk flavor, um, especially if you haven't uh, seared them well enough. So with this on a whim, right? Like that, like that day. So this the Saturday before Super Bowl. Um, I was baking a bunch of bread and just having fun. I had a pork shoulder that I I had bought, and at some point I was gonna uh, cook. And I just thought to myself, hey, let, let's do the pork shoulder real quick, right? So the pork shoulder process was mustard, a little bit of meat church honey hog rub, right? Into a half hotel pan, into my oven, turn the oven to one sixty five sous vide, walk away for eighteen hours. Came back 18 hours later, pork shoulder was perfectly moist, perfectly tender and able to pull apart, but it wasn't like that fibrous tender that you get when you just completely like annihilate it, right? Able to pull it apart and then mix in the juices, right? So now it's nice and juicy. The only thing that was really missing was the smoke factor, right? But you could easily blast with smoke before you before you sous vide, um, which I'll, I'll, I'll touch on in a second. Now, uh, here's, again, where the oven really shines. I hadn't done my chicken wings yet, okay? So I take the pulled pork. It's, it's, it, I've incorporated all the juices and the drippings and the fat back into it, right? And I uh, covered it with foil. I, I preemptively, so I didn't have to you know, open anything up, I preemptively stuck the probe thermometer for the uh, uh, combi oven inside the pulled pork. And then I... Uh, stuck the whole thing in the fridge. Obviously not the oven, right? The, the thermometer detaches from the oven. And I stuck that in the fridge and I continued to bake some other stuff. And I, I did my chicken wings and I put out the appetizers. Uh, my, my good buddy came over uh, to watch the game. And uh, we sat down and started watching the game. And right before the game, uh, I took the, the chilled now uh, pulled pork that was shredded with the internal probe thermometer stuck in it. I put it in the combi oven. Uh, with the uh, the probe stuck, you know, attached to the oven, and I left it. I left it off, right? Now I'm sitting in my Lazy Boy. It's, uh, you know, towards the end of the first quarter. Hey, Dylan, when do you want to eat? Do you want to eat at halftime or do you want to wait to the end of the game? And he's like, ah, let's, uh, let's go ahead and eat at halftime. All right. So without moving an inch, well, maybe an inch because I had to lean over a little bit, to pull the uh, the iPhone out of my pocket, I fire up my app, and I say, hey, uh, Oven, can you do me a favor? Can you do, I want you to, to turn on at full steam, right? So I want you to do 212 degrees Fahrenheit for your oven setting with 100% humidity or 100% steam, and I want you to, to hold that temperature uh, until my internal probe thermometer uh, hits 165 degrees Fahrenheit, which is the safe temperature for reheating meats, especially braised meats, right? And then I want you to drop to a holding temperature of uh, 145. Got it? Cool. Press play. Didn't move an inch, right? It took about 20 minutes for it to come to temperature, Drop back down, held perfectly. Halftime comes around. <laughs> the weekend, who's this guy? My daughter knows them. Okay, cool. So go slice some buns, put them on my little flat top, toast up the buns, put out the coleslaw, right? Put out the other sides that we're going to have. Uh, take when everyone everyone is ready and everything's ready to rock. I pull the pulled pork, perfectly heated decor uh, with zero worries out of the oven, stirring the juices, and then we make our pulled pork sandwiches. We sit down, we eat, and it was perfect. And the flavor on this was great because it was very, very clean. A very clean, pure pork taste because there is none of that sous vide funk which builds up when you do a uh, long sous vide. So that's been my experience so far with the Anova Combi oven. Now, we will be, um, I'll report more because 
you know, once once my cooks get their hands on it, it's going to go through um, a lot of rough treatment. It's just the nature of the beast on a professional hotline. Um, so I I think that that will be the um, the uh, ruggedness test or the resilience test uh, for the combi oven. If it can if it can last a few months on my hotline, uh, it'll it'll last years in your kitchen. So we'll see. Now with that said, um, let's go ahead and start scrolling through some of your comments and questions. See what we got here. Uh, good morning, good morning, good morning. Uh, da, 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 da. Just reading through your comments here. Uh, speaking of poached eggs, I recently saw YouTube uh, first draining your eggs in a wire strainer before dropping into 180 degree water for three to four minutes. I tried it and it worked great. How is the combi for baking? Yeah, so we touched on that. That's amazing. Love the steam injection. The steam injection is great. Um, da, 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 da. <laughs> um, let's see. Cool. So I think that just about covered it. And I, I also, I think that gives you guys a really good understanding of a, a combi oven and whether or not it, uh, it'll fit uh, in your kitchen. Um, if you um if if you have like a, a a toaster oven taking up space in your home kitchen you, you it's 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 days are numbered right um and and in a way that i explain this to you know everyone likes their crock pots everyone loves their crock pots i hate crock pots i mean they they seem like a good idea but the problem is 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 you don't really have a whole lot of control of the temperature. What I like is that you can sit something on your counter without taking up any oven space or any uh, you know a whole lot of space in your kitchen and you can walk away from it for 4 to 8 hours, right? But it almost it it dries your meat out, right? The 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 temperature of a crock pot is too harsh and people want to talk about oh how tender and juicy their meats are, but you're just you're misconstruing the fact that your meat is falling off the bone or shreddable with tenderness and they're two completely different things, right? So, a a, a way that I explain this to some people, I say, "Well, do you like crock pots?" I'm like, "Yeah, I love a crock pot." Well, imagine if you had a crock pot with an internal probe thermometer that you could set to basically cook your meat to whatever temperature you wanted to, and then it would just turn down to a holding temperature and hold it there for hours until you're ready to eat without ever drying it out or making your meat fibrous. Would you like that? Would you dig that? Yeah. Cool. And it can also bake bread and roast chicken and all that sort of stuff. So it's um, a worthy, worthy investment. And um, outside of that, I might give you guys some some momentary or small updates here and there when there's something notable to to speak of on the Innova. Uh, but I think that we've addressed this device um, for free. <laughs> for uh, uh, you know, we spend a lot of time talking about, it. and it's important that we do. I mean, I, I joke about you know Innova not hit me back on Instagram or or paying me for for this stuff because I know we're selling a lot of Innovas using this podcast. But honestly, all that stuff doesn't even really matter. It's it's, it's just a fun running joke. What what my job to do is to make you aware of uh, of new technology or new items that are going to streamline your your execution or or a, a new technique uh, that's going to help you um, serve a better product. Right? Six hundred dollars is a very low barrier to entry for what this device offers you. Uh, and it's a definitely, in my opinion, a strong buy. Now, it's still a newer device. Um, is there issues with durability? I don't know. I've only been using it for a few weeks. Um, it is what it is. But again, for for six hundred dollars, you know, the fact that they're able to make this thing for sub a thousand dollars is 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 pretty pretty impressive, right? Um. If I were replacing a standard oven, what about replacing it with an Anova? Um, I I think um, you would, if, unless you're cooking in small batches. Like if you're cooking for one or two and you don't do a whole lot of uh, of entertaining, um, then it should be fine, right? This is a, a great for like if you got like a like a cabin somewhere, right, with electricity but not a whole lot of space, or possibly even like an RV or something like that. 
Um, I think this would be great in that environment. I would definitely miss um, my uh, my home of it. Now, here's the thing that I, I, I would love to hear Anova's feedback on is, well, if they can make uh, an oven this size for 600 bucks, can they make me a full-size oven for 3000 Because if they could make me, I mean, you basically take four of these ovens, right? Stack two on the bottom, stack two on top. It's, about, it's a roughly the size, maybe a little bit smaller than your normal uh, home range. If they could make me one for $3,000 with a probe thermometer and steam injection, all the bells and whistles that my, uh, my current Innova has, I would pull out the credit card right now without even thinking about it. 100%. I'd pull it out and order it right now. Um, another thing is I'm getting ready to, to remodel my home kitchen here um, in a, you know, maybe sometime later this year. Um, and I'm really looking at creating a home to have two Anovas, uh, two Anova ovens uh, in my house. Why? Because I'm crazy like that, right? I might want to uh, bake some amazing sourdough bread while I'm uh, sous vide a uh, a pork uh, loin or whatever, right? I mean, you're, it's it's and and so when you get into that sort of environment, it actually might be more beneficial to have two of the smaller ovens that you can have two different things going on in at the same time uh, versus one of the larger ovens that would be your your normal range. But my thought being, if I'm going to have a range in my kitchen in the first place with an oven underneath it, um, could Anova make me one for three, four thousand dollars? If so, that is a massive market for them, and they will, uh, you know, because they they somehow were able to take this technology that only existed in uh, ovens around this size for the home kitchen in the five thousand to ten thousand dollar range, and put that same technology in a sub one thousand dollar unit. Right. So um, whatever they figured out to allow them to do that, whether uh, maybe the other companies were just overcharging us forever, whether they have some sort of patent on something. Right. They figured something out that made this technology that made this oven production way less expensive for them. Right. So if they could then transfer that into a full size home oven, um, it would I think it would be it would revolutionize the space, quite frankly. How many appliances will this oven replace? Well, that depends on how appliance crazy you are, right? People love air fr fryers. Pfft, I don't like my air fryer. I don't. Why? I just, it's another thing I got to just pull out and someone sent me an air fryer for free. Uh, I used it once. I'm like, cool, it roasts potatoes. Uh, well, I got an oven that does that. Um, people love like their Instapots and things like that. I don't have one. Why? Because I have a little pressure cooker. Then if I... You know, outside of a pressure cooker, like, why, why do I need an Instapot? Like, I know it does, like, 20 different things, all, like, kind of somewhat uh, acceptably well, right? But, like, I don't need that, right? Um, and um, toaster oven, I don't have a toaster oven, right? Would I buy one? Maybe, but not after I have an Anova, right? I don't have a really a, a use for it. So my main drivers for gadgets... Um, that I have to have is now, now the Innova combi is on the list. Okay. So I have to have one of those in my home kitchen, right? Love that thing. Um, you have to have a microwave because your coffee gets cold. All right. And microwaves are just, um, they're nice for reheating like leftover Chinese food and shit like that. But most, most kitchens have a microwave. So Innova, a microwave, uh, my tabletop steamer, right? That's the one thing you can steam in the Innova. But it takes longer, and I wish the steam setting was more powerful for actually steaming large batches of vegetables. Um, if they were, and I think that's just a setting that they could actually probably change with a firmware update, because they're more looking at like water preservation in the tank um, and things like that. That'd be my guess. Uh, but I would love it if I could just set this thing to like bellowing steam mode. And if I could, uh, like so, yesterday or two days ago at work, I did. Um, four pounds of green beans steam. So I steam blanched them in a uh, in, in two perforated half hotel pans and it took 15 minutes and they were great, right? A little bit slow for my liking. Um, I, and because the steam is a little bit gentle. Um, so I have my, my little round double-decker steamer that I love. I use that for blanching vegetables, for um, you know cooking like uh, frozen uh, dim sums and bows and things like that. Um, I just, I love my steamer. Electric kettle uh, for the tea, um, my flat top griddle, 
and of course the Zojirushi rice co cooker, right? Um, I have a small pressure cooker, but that's more like a, that's a pot, right? It's not really a gadget, so that's off to the side. Um, and outside of that, that's about it for my gadgets. I mean, I have like a whole gadget shelf of like uh, Cuisinarts and blenders and things like that that uh, I've either acquired over the years or people have have sent me to to test. Um, but I just I don't find myself reaching for them that much. Um, uh, oh yeah, and I have my KitchenAid, which I have a love hate relationship with, um, because the KitchenAid is a whole thing: pulling it down, setting it up, uh, kneading the dough, and washing it. If I baked more, if I did like more desserts, uh, I'd probably love my KitchenAid a lot more. Um, but I'm mainly a bread baker, and every single time I, I need bread in it, I'm like, I could have just done this by hand, and it would have been uh, faster with less cleanup. So. Uh, that is that. Let's kind of, let's go through Discord real quick. Let's see. Um, I have been cooking in a three-quart Instapot for five minutes. Very convenient, and I like the results. But my wife sometimes complains about the rice being too firm. Will I get better results with the Zojirushi rice cooker? Which model? Price ranges from 40 to 240 Um... The Zojirushi gives you the best rice ever, in my opinion. Um, and there's certain things where you're like, uh, that extra five percent doesn't matter. Okay, so I'm gonna I'm gonna use this item over here um, because it's, it's it's cheaper and it's easier and it's gonna get me like ninety five percent of the way there. And I'm not gonna spend the extra money on that last five percent. For me, when it comes to rice, that last 5% is a big deal. Um, so the, the smaller units, the cheaper units, I don't know. I, I, I mean, I would assume that if it's a Zojirushi, uh, that it's good. I got the big Mama Jamma, like the 1.8 liter. I think it's um, like $300-ish on Amazon, um, and I love it. I would never replace it. Um, I think home cooks like the Instapot because they only have four sad burners on their range. I only have four sad burners, too. I don't know. I think the whole Instapot craze, um, you know, so to be fair, uh, they sent out a ton of Instapots to a ton of uh, like YouTube influencers to shoot videos on it, and they forgot your boy again, right? So that instantly made me not like it because I'm like, look, if you want me to show people how to take this $150 electric pot and like do some cool shit in it, right? Like I'm your guy, right? But instead, they send it to a bunch of other YouTube people with you know bigger followings than me because they're more consistent at producing videos and growing their audiences, and they don't have an actual day job. So I get it, right? But so I was instantly kind of butt hurt by Instapot, if uh, we're being honest. So you got to pass that through the filter, right? Outside of that, again, people they they equate Instapots with some sort of like magic tenderness. So I have. Uh, those who were, remain unnamed, but people in my life that aren't professional cooks, right? Say, oh, I, I take my pork tenderloin, I stick it in my Instapot, it cooks in there all day. I come home, I shred it up, and it's delicious. I make tacos with it. And I'm like, bullshit, it's not delicious, right? If you're cooking a pork tenderloin all day and it's shredding apart, you've overcooked it, right? And because you have some sort of like green salsa sauce in there, and you're putting like cotilla cheese and some sour cream, and you're rolling it up in a burrito, you're tricking yourself into thinking that shit's good, but it's not. It's not. What I do like about the Instapot is it is sometimes convenient to have an electric countertop pressure cooker. And from what I hear, um, it does a pretty good job of that. However, I have induction burners plus a, uh, a, a, a pressure cooker, uh, traditional pressure cooker pot that works on an induction burner um and you know uh so I'm, I'm never running out of that that space right i never find myself be, uh thinking god i really wish i just had a countertop pressure cooker so specifically for the reason that instapot did not send me one to review when they sent out thousands of them i say it's a no buy i think they suck sorry just my opinion um and, and to be clear, I've never actually cooked with an Instapot. I know lots of people who do. Um, so I just want to make sure I'm being honest with you guys. Okay. In the end, Instapot is just a pressure cooker. Yep. Um, ba -ba -ba. My friends love their Instapot. Like the idea of just throwing in the ingredients and walking away. They use it uh, for everything. 
and when it produces inferior results. Yeah, so that's the thing, right? But here's uh, here's what I'm telling you is you could do you, do you have an Instapot? Do you have a slow cooker? Do you have a toaster oven? Right? The uh, Nova Combi can do everything those things do way better with a lot more precision. Which, by the way, should be their fucking tagline at the top of above the fold on their website. Anova, you're welcome again. You're welcome again. I'm I'm too f- stupid to to not just. I, I can't hold back. It's too good, right? This shit's too good. Imagine you 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 go, you say, hey, what's this Anova culinary precision cooker bullshit about? Let me see. I'm gonna pop, type this into Google, and boom, above the fold, there's like the the oven in the background, which we named Lucy, by the way, right? So I mean, if your equipment gets a name from your cooks, you know they like it. So we named her Lucy. She's in the background, kind of faded in her sexy, sleek black. And then at the top, in like white lettering, that's kind of sh- back, back shadowed. It's like, you know, questioned. Do you have a pressure cooker? Or no, do you have an air fryer, uh, a toaster oven, and a, a crock pot? The Innova Combi oven can do everything those do and better. You're welcome, Innova. Uh, pressure cooker saved my life uh, when I remodeled my kitchen. Yeah, pressure cookers are great. I I love pressure cookers. And quite frankly, if you if you don't have a pressure cooker in your life, um, and your um, you know the a a, a, a countertop plug-in pressure cooker is super convenient. The uh, Instapot's not a bad buy, just for the fact that it it's a it's a solid countertop pressure cooker, right? If I'm being fair, you know, if you're in the market for a pressure cooker. Instapot's not a bad buy because it does other shit too, and it also is a sufficient pressure cooker. Okay. All right, all right. Well, thank you everyone for tuning in to the live uh, podcast. Now, after this, I'm going to have to jam uh, straight to work. It's Friday. We're going to be busy, but I'm going to try and find a break later today or tonight when I get off uh, to post this video up on our YouTube live feed uh, and also to drop the audio version of this podcast uh, into whatever your uh, podcast player of, of choice is. So we will do this again next week. Same bat time, same bat place, 7 a.m. Pacific Standard Time, 10 a.m. Eastern, every single Friday. Come rain, shine, uh, crazy storms in in Texas, or a ass-kicking for me in the kitchen. I will still make time to hop on here live with y'all. Thanks again for tuning in. Cook something delicious this weekend, and I will see you next week.